Christianity has a rich evidential history, yet many of us are ill-prepared to make the case for why we believe and what we believe. Well, J. Warner Wallace is a noted cold case detective who's been featured on Dateline and Fox News, a former atheist. Today he uses his investigative skills to help Christians defend the truth claims of the faith. Good to have you with us today, sir. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, kind of let's get your story a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Going from atheism to a defender of the Christian faith and the truth claims of the scripture, uh, that must have been quite a journey. And I wasn't uh, really raised in an environment where I had Christians to kind of counsel me or even to share what they believed. I knew Christians, mm -hmm. but the Christians I knew were kind of broken into two categories. I had the new uh, officers. I was about 35 when I first started examining Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I knew officers who were Christians, and they would make a case for why a particular suspect was involved in a, in a crime or why a particular set of facts would lead to this conclusion. They were very good at that. But mm -hmm. if I asked them, well, give me five reasons why you believe the Bible is true, they were really, well, I hadn't really thought of that that because way. Because it is. Wow. Yeah, because it is. <laughs> and, and that really was unsatisfying for Einstein. Uh -huh. How can you have this evidential approach about your professional work, right. yet you don't seem to have an evidential approach about the most important claims you, you, you cling to? Yes. The other group I knew that were Christians were the people who were taken to jail, because many of them would tell us that they were Christians. Uh -huh. And I thought to myself, if this is what it means to be a Christian, either to be somebody who holds a belief without really any good reason for it, or somebody who doesn't seem to behave as though they have this belief at all, I didn't want any part of either one of those right, things. Right. So when I first started looking at Christianity, my wife was uh, what, more What caused you to start looking at in the beginning uh, well, in the first place? I think my wife Susie was the one who really said, hey, you know, should we raise our own kids without any beliefs and, and should we go to church? And I was willing to go as an atheist if mm -hmm. it made her happy. Mm -hmm. And the first evangelical church I ever sat in, uh, the pastor kind of pitched Jesus as a wise, ancient sage. He said a lot of other things too, but that, that aspect of Jesus intrigued me. Mm -hmm. So I said, let me, let me see what he has to say. And as I read through the gospel accounts, I recognized the attributes of eyewitness accounts because I was working these cases all the time. And there's a certain amount of variation between any two eyewitnesses. And the level of variation in the accounts was very much similar to what I was seeing in the Gospels. Uh -huh. And that began for me an investigation into whether or not those Gospels were reliable. Could I trust uh -huh. them to tell me what they were, well, what's true about Jesus of Nazareth? And so I wanted to kind of extend that process. About six months later, I found myself, uh, you know, surrendering to the Gospel because, you know, I, I was able to overcome my own intellectual barriers mm -hmm. uh, by, by looking at the evidence uh, as, as, as eyewitness accounts. Mm. You know, sometimes as we defend the faith, as I think some Christians feel like the, because we are sometimes ill-equipped, that the evidence will not bear itself out. But you found that to be just the opposite. Yeah, I think that is, that, years later, I became a, a pastor. And, mm -hmm. and through that process, I became a youth pastor. And I was working with high schoolers and junior hires. And what I saw was that the first year of kids that we graduated, the seniors, were, they walked away from the church within the first, mm -hmm. say, 10 weeks of, of university life. And it wasn't that they were convinced so dramatically in the first 10 weeks. They had had doubts for years that weren't being addressed. And then they finally had the freedom to walk away from the church once they were in university. And I thought to myself, what, what, what am I doing wrong as a youth pastor? I wasn't equipping them to know that it's true evidentially. We, we did a lot of fun things in youth group. We, we had a very experiential Sunday uh, you know, services, but they weren't making a case for why this is true. So I always say, that if, if we can't do that for our young people, be prepared. If this is simply a, a subjective opinion that we like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, it's going to run up against the hard facts of university life as they're presented. Mm -hmm. And as the culture presents the kind of scientific approach to everything in, the, in, our, in our culture, then, then our subjective opinion as Christians is eventually going to be surrendered to the scientific fact of whatever a competing worldview is being presented to our young people. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I had to really start to, to, to draw back to my own experience, to my own evidential uh, investigation, and share that with my students so that if they decide to run off from the church in, in college and do stupid, because we all do that, right? Right, mm -hmm. right. But they, it's, that's on them because they want to chase their passions. I get it. That's on you. But if you're leaving because you don't believe this is true anymore, well, that's really on me as your pastor or me as your dad mm -hmm. to be able to make sure that you know this is true. So you can go as far right. as you want. That's like that rubber band theology, right? Yeah. The further you go, the more it stings when you come back. So just don't go too far. Yeah. But it's really about helping my young people to know that this is true. In a culture that's truly trying to incline us toward a post-truth, we hear that a lot, right? right. This idea that it doesn't matter if it's true. We just talked about the Australian uh, yeah, the uh, survey, survey mm -hmm. right? And how, what really matters to them is, are you good people? Right. Mm -hmm. It's behavior. Right. If you're nice, okay, I might join you. 
Yeah. Well, really, uh, there's a lot of things that can make us nice that aren't even true. Does it matter anymore <laughs> right, that what we believe matter. is true? Right. Or is it just it works? Yeah, yeah. So we have to help, I think, our young people rethink yeah. this. And, and I, I try to kind of pitch it as, look, we could have blind <clears throat> faith, which is a faith that is without any, you could be here accidentally in the right place. You don't even know why it's the right place. But you can be in the right place accidentally. Or you could have an informed faith. And that's what I call a forensic right. faith, this idea that mm -hmm. faith is the most reasonable inference from evidence, even though you're still going to have a number of unanswered uh, questions. Right. Because right. we all do. And in every worldview, there are unanswered questions, yeah. regardless of where you stand. So you're taking a step of trust across a, bar across a void, but we want to take the smallest possible step, given what the evidence, evidence indicates. Says. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Jim, you're a cold case detective. This is... Possibly one of the coldest cases of 2,000 yes. years <laughs> yes, old. Yes, I would say so. Right. Uh, what kind of, um, going through this in, in, in your, your kind of quest there and, and discoveries, uh, what were some of the key things that stood out in the Gospels that were reminiscent or are reminiscent of your detective work? Yeah, lots of things. Uh, one of the things I talked about in a movie called God's Not Dead 2, they gave us a, like a six-minute uh, chance to make a case for the gospel. That was you? That was me. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so the idea here was to say, well, one of the things that really started my interest was what I call unintentional eyewitness support, where a witness will come in and make a claim, and you'll think to yourself, how could that be true? It makes no sense at all. And it almost sounds like, like, like the witness could be wrong. And mm -hmm. then later on, you would discover a witness who fills in the gap uh -huh. for you mm -hmm. and makes, makes sense it, of the first eyewitness's account. Yeah. You see this throughout the Gospels. They, they seem to be either incredibly well-planned trickery, or it's just that one account misses a detail or excludes a detail. So when Jesus is standing in front of Caiaphas and they are challenging him, you think you're God? Tell us who hit you. Well, couldn't he just say in the one account, it doesn't tell you, why would that be hard? I mean, you're standing right in front of me, you just hit me, you hit me. But that account doesn't tell you that he was blindfolded. It's the other account that makes sense of the first account. If you didn't have both eyewitness accounts, this wouldn't make any sense at all. Mm -hmm. And this is what you see a lot of times in our casework, is you get this old uh, case from 30 years ago, and if it isn't for two witnesses, you wouldn't really know. So that's what started my investigation. But then as I cross-checked it against archaeology, cross-checked it against all the other ancient accounts from the non-Christian world who discussed Jesus of Nazareth, or the first Christians, I started to realize we have good corroborative evidence. This story hasn't changed over time. The eyewitnesses are not showing any particular bias that would cause them to lie to us. And they were written early enough to have actually been written by people who saw the stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. Jim, this is so fascinating to me. For people who are watching saying, I'm not an apologist like you are. Right. I'm not a former atheist, so I don't have that passion. I, I didn't go and do the evidential work. How can I get started? What's the number one thing a Christian okay, so, needs so that's to what know? We, that's why I wrote this book, because okay. I realized as I was making the case for uh, either the reliability of the Gospels or the case for God's existence, I've encountered people who are like, why do I even need to make a case? Mm -hmm. So I've written a book that really helps you, makes the case for why you should make the case. And I hope it gives you detective strategies. So one of the simplest things is learning how to take notes and read case files hmm. like detectives read them. So it's typically, I know people who open the Bible and they'll pick that one verse, and that's God speaking to me today. I get that. But what we do with case files is we read everything in context. We read it several times. We compare two eyewitness accounts. We take lots of good case notes. And that process I describe in the book to help people start. Because in the end, your kids don't want to listen to Jim Wallace. They want to know from mom and dad, why is this true? Right. We don't need another million-dollar apologist. We need a million one-dollar apologists. All of us need to get mm -hmm. in the game. Wonderful. Wow. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for being with us Thanks today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Our guest, it. Detective J. Warner Wallace, and his latest book, Forensic Faith. To connect with Jim, you can go to coldcasechristianity.com or go to harvest-tv.com. You'll find an easy link there. Still to come, Brian Bush with your prayer request. But up next, we're going to hear from Pastor Mark Lance with today's teaching. We'll be right back.